Now we have Dr. Timothy Mousseau from the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of South Carolina. He's going to talk about Chernobyl, Fukushima and other hot places and the biological implications of these. Thanks, Helen. Uh, I guess we'll bring this up. Let me start by thanking Helen and Mally and the, the PSR for organizing and hosting this event. It's really wonderful to be here. It's a fantastic opportunity. And surprisingly, uh, I think, well, maybe not surprisingly, this really is the biggest event of its sort, I think, around the world this, today. I, I think this really is the main event, so <laughs> count yourself lucky to be here. Uh, oh, sorry. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm, I'm used to screaming and yelling to a group of students, so uh, I'm not used to talking into a microphone like this. Anyway, uh, I've been working in Chernobyl with my colleagues for about 13 years now, and um, this first slide really here is to remind me to, to acknowledge uh, the, uh, the many partners, some of the key partners that we've had over the years, especially Anders Muller, uh, who's been my uh, main collaborator and partner for, since the very beginning. Um, what you may notice from this list of co-authors is that there are no Japanese names on that list. And I did want to make the point that uh, there, we've had many uh, very important Japanese collaborators, but who would rather not be named in most of this work. Uh, our first publication, we had a long list of our, our collaborators. The second <laughs> publication, we were missing three of them. And the, the latest publication, all but one of our half a dozen colleagues really didn't want to be uh, have their name publicly associated with the work. And it was um, not that they don't want to help us, but they've been very, very helpful but they were concerned about the long-term impacts. The other thing I wanted to mention, uh, point out in the slide are our sponsors, of course, and, uh, especially the Samuel Freeman Charitable Trust, uh, who have been very supportive of this work over the years. Right, so uh, a number of years ago, prior to 311, we uh, started our work just by chance uh, into the impacts of radioactive contaminants in Chernobyl, and it really was an interest driven by evolutionary genetics, evolutionary biology, not radioecology, not uh, nuclear medicine, uh, not anti-nuclear activism in any way. And um, <laughs> we started our, our work with, with birds primarily because they're easy to see, they're easy to catch, they're easy to identify, they're easy to count, and some of them you can even track throughout their lifespan. And because they can't see, smell, or have even heard about the radiation per se. They're not put off by the fence around Chernobyl. So they come in when they do. Uh, we can follow them and we can track their lives uh, in the very most highest contaminated areas. And this gives us uh, a lot more resolution, a lot more power to conduct studies of the long-term health impacts, at least if you're a bird or a bug, of these contaminants. Uh, and of course, following uh, 311, uh, we've changed the name of our uh, group to the Chernobyl Plus Fukushima Research Initiative. I don't expect you to read this slide. It, <laughs> it, it, it's actually just a list of the 50 or so publications that we've generated in the last seven or eight years. Uh, and, and really all it's to show you is that we've been busy. Um, and because my, I know my time up here is rather short, um, I'm, I'm going to start backwards uh, in my talk. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with the conclusions, and then we'll move backwards through some of the uh, supporting information just for fun. And uh, so the major findings, uh, after working in Chernobyl since 2000 and in Fukushima since July of 2011, uh, and we can say most of this from Chernobyl though, most organisms that have been looked at in any detail show significantly increased rates of genetic damage in direct proportion to the level of exposure to radioactive contaminants. We have a couple of papers on this topic. Uh, I'd be happy to point you to them. Uh, we've reviewed the literature, as have others, and uh, it, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Most organisms 
living in these areas show increased rates of deformities and developmental abnormalities, some of them you might even call tumors and cancers, um, in direct proportion to the contamination levels that they're living in. And because these are animals and plants and things like that, they don't move too much far usually. Most of the organisms that we've looked at show reduced fertility rates. Uh, in terms of the male birds, about 40% of the male birds in the more contaminated parts of Chernobyl are completely sterile. They have no sperm. And we've looked. <laughs> I'm not going to show you how we've looked, but we, we've looked very hard. And 40% uh, uh, of the males have either no sperm or just a few dead sperm when we take the samples. Most of them that we've been able to, to measure have reduced lifespans. And as a consequence of the reduced fertilities and reduced lifespans, most of these species, most of these populations, have smaller sizes, reduced growth rates. The, the numbers of individuals in most of these groups are lower in the more contaminated areas of Chernobyl. And as a consequence of this, many of these species have actually gone locally extinct in the more contaminated areas. Uh, so biodiversity has been affected. The last two points are a little more speculative and they're a little bit more based on indirect evidence. Uh, they're hard to test directly, but, but I think our indirect evidence is pretty strong, especially now that we can compare the findings from Chernobyl to those that we're seeing in Fukushima, and we hope to compare Fukushima and Chernobyl to other uh, naturally hot plus places around the world. Uh, the first is that um, it's very clear in Chernobyl, ironically, because the radiation levels are so low, so low, because they're low enough that organisms don't drop dead immediately as a result of exposure, they live long enough, some of them live long enough to accumulate mutations and to pass them on to the next generation. And these will accumulate over multiple generations. This is our hypothesis. I think the data we have is strongly supportive of that. And we're not the first ones to suggest this, of course. There are no original <laughs> ideas in science. Uh, yeah. uh, the, the last point here, uh, which is also equally interesting, I think, is that, again, because this isn't a black hole in its entirety, some of these individuals live long enough to reproduce, to pass, to, to, to migrate out of the area. The young of the year, some of them will migrate out, carrying the mutations that they've accumulated. So we see the effects of mutations in populations that have never seen radiation per se. And so I think, from my perspective, those, as an evolutionary biologist, those are, the, those are two important points. Most of our work has been done on animal models. Um, and, and, you know, it, it <laughs> and in some ways this, is, this has been good because it's allowed us to sort of pass through some of the gates and barriers that might be, have been erected for people who study human populations. And if you're working on birds and bees, yeah, you know, you don't get taken too seriously for the most part. So, so you can do things that, that other people can't do. But also, perhaps, Birds don't drink or smoke or get depressed, as far as I can tell. Uh, maybe there's a few male birds who get depressed about not finding a girlfriend, but uh, you know, the, uh, for the most part, we don't have to worry about some of the environmental issues that have been suggested as important for uh, some of the effects that we see in the human populations, uh, alcoholism in particular, and drinking. And you know the sorts of questions we ask again, as we're just we're just biologists. So, you know, we ask, uh, can we measure mutation rates in these natural populations? Does it relate to the radiation levels, contamination levels? Are there any consequences to the mutations? We all carry around lots of mutations inside our bodies. Most of them are never expressed. Most of them have no effect. Uh, so, you know, quite quite conceivably. The levels that we're talking about, maybe they induce extra mutations, but, but they don't matter because there are no expressed consequences. So we need to test for that. Are there deformities? Are there neurological developmental effects? These kinds of things. Of course, you know, all of us are different in this room. Some of those differences are the result of mutations. Most of them don't matter. 
It probably doesn't matter too much that I'm missing a little hair here as a result of some mutation. And uh, it, it, it's probably not influencing my survival or ability to reproduce. Uh, and, um, and so, you know, a lot of these mutations, even if they're expressed, don't really influence survival or reproduction or adaptation. And so we need to get at that. It doesn't matter. And finally, uh, population sizes and ecosystem consequences. All right, so here's where we're a little different than most people. This is, this is sort of a, the schematic of the approach that we've taken. It's, uh, it, it's, it's kind of unique, and I, I really uh, have to give a lot of credit to my collaborator, Anders Mahler, for, for really pushing this. And, and basically, what we do, so, so the world is, you know, the natural world is a complicated, heterogeneous place. Even in New York City, you know, every corner is a little bit different with respect to the amount of sunlight, the, the micro temperature, uh, the amount of rainfall, uh, the sorts of other plants that are there, the other bird species that might be flying in. Every, every point in space and time is unique. And so how do you factor out that variability to ask simply the, the simple question of, or not so simple question of, what is the effect of radioactivity or radioactive contaminants on an individual, a population, a species? And the way we've done this, got at this kind of question, is to do, employ what I call a massively replicated biotic inventory design. It's a, long, it's a long word. Basically, we go to as many places as we can squeeze into a short period of time, and we count every last organism that we see in these different locations. So in the case of Fukushima, we've made 700 of these inventories in the last two years. In the case of Chernobyl, uh, we stopped at 896 because it takes a long time to do these things. But we, we go to a spot and we measure everything. Uh, the numbers of birds, the species of birds, the numbers of insects, the numbers of spiders, uh, whatever is possible. And we also measure all of the particular, all of the environmental variables that might be of relevance in terms of determining the presence or absence and abundance of a given group of organisms. Uh, so the meteorology, the hydrology, the geology, the community of plants. If, is there water around? What kind of plant species are there? Uh, that kind of thing. And then we, of course, measure the radiation level too. Right. Uh, for the most part, we've used very simple measures of radiation level, and we've, we've learned that that actually captures most of the heterogeneity in radiation just by using a simple Geiger counter. That's certainly a good proxy, a, a good proxy for most of the sorts of things that we're looking at, uh, as we've learned in the last year. We throw this into a GIS kind of model, geographic information system kind of model, employ some fancy multivariate statistics, uh, but nothing so fancy that anyone in this room probably could learn to, to use them, and to generate predictive models of radiation effects on populations. So when we do this, we can get at the partial effects of the radioactive contaminants on natural populations. It's worked pretty well. And so here uh, you can see our areas of Belarus and Ukraine. This actually doesn't show all of the sites, but they're throughout these areas, inside the exclusion zone, outside the exclusion zone, 896 surveys to date. Here's uh, Japan, Fukushima. This is the general area that we've been to. Tokyo's down here, of course. Koryama, 300,000 people. Fukushima City, 300,000 people. Here's the area of highest contamination. Here's a closer view of the areas that we've been sampling from. Um, and you'll note that we have not managed to get to this area here of highest contamination despite our, our best efforts. Last summer we did manage to get inside you know, the 20 kilometer zone uh, and to some areas that were on the order of 100 microsieverts per hour. So a good, good solid range. The trouble actually in Fukushima isn't finding hot spots. <laughs> the trouble is finding cold spots to compare them to. Uh, and and, and we have spent way more time looking for control areas with, with, with minimal contamination than we have looking for the hot areas. Uh, and I think that's informative. Uh, here, so, so, so the one way, the first way we get this information is to do biotic inventories where we just basically look and count 
everything. Another way is to uh, set up nets for the birds. We, we set up about half a kilometer of nets. Anybody recognize? I'm sure you can recognize this guy, but anybody know this guy? Yeah, Jeremy Wade, the River Monsters. <laughs> They're doing a show on Chernobyl called The Atomic Assassin. But anyway, they were out to, uh, to see how we count birds. And unfortunately, this video doesn't work, but this is just to show you that we do catch birds. And we get blood samples, we get feather samples, we measure everything that's possible to be measured on a bird in a, in a relatively short period of time. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, this is actually a lot of fun because we get to handle the birds. We also get sperm from the males if they have any. And we don't hurt the birds. Uh, we do release all the birds. We don't engage in destructive sampling at all. Uh, so that's how we catch the birds and get bird data. Uh, how do we measure radiation? Well, we do it a number of ways. Uh, you know, in the good old days, we just took our Geiger counter. Uh, in the last few years, we've gotten a little more sophisticated, and we've taken our radionuclide identifier system into the field, and this will actually give us, you know, not only will it give us the radiation level, but it will also tell us what's accounting for the radiation in the given areas, which, which is interesting. So this is a $15,000 Geiger counter, essentially, uh, but very, very useful. We can take the same instrument. Well, another way that we look at radiation uh, dosage uh, these days is we can take little TLDs. These are tiny little crystal chips that capture radiation uh, that we can then return to the lab and read how much external radiation and what the external dose that this bird has actually gotten by taking this TLD, putting it on a bird band, putting it on the bird, releasing the bird, then recapturing the bird, we can get a pretty good idea of how much radiation they're actually getting. The, the first bird there was actually my pet bird, who was the guinea pig for, for the system. And you can't see this because it's too dark uh, and it's too bright, both at the same time. This is the barn swallow, again showing one of the TLDs here. Can you see that at all? It's just, it's just washed out. Yeah. Anyway, but you could see it here, right? You can see this little package here, which has basically got this. Anyway, and then the last way that we measure radiation actually is to uh, uh, take birds, put them in a special lead cave in the field without hurting them, and measure their whole body burden. And this has just given us a lot of information. You get these little spectra that look like that. And it turns out that, that uh, we now know that there's actually um, a very good relationship between our simple Geiger counter measures of background radiation and the place that we catch the bird and how much radiation they're experiencing both externally and internally. And I'm just going to zoom ahead because I do want to get to some real data shortly. All right, so undoubtedly a few of you in this room have heard these stories, right? The Chernobyl zone is this thriving Eden for wildlife. Who hasn't heard that story? You know, you, 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 you have heard it, yeah. Yeah, it's just, you haven't heard that story? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> it, uh, it drives me crazy uh, because it, 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 it's been perpetuated by uh, primarily a few journalists uh, and, and a few unscrupulous sorts uh, and it probably results is the result of this statement generated by the Chernobyl Forum uh, a few years ago, who suggested that the populations of many plants and animals have expanded and the present environmental conditions have been a positive impact on the biota of the Chernobyl exclusion zone. And they've also suggested that most of the human morbidity is the result of stress, right? But the truth is, at the time this report was written, there were no studies of biodiversity and abundance in the Chernobyl zone. None. So how could they come to this conclusion in the absence of data? Well, of course, that's the way it's done, right? The absence of data is used to support uh, the notion that there are no effects. Yeah, anyway, so, um, so we decided to use that as our call to action, and we went out and started counting all the critters as we did. Uh, there's, there, and there's a few critters in the zone. Uh, these are my favorite, the Chevalsky's horses, beautiful horses that were introduced into the zone. Uh, they were actually in Dane, they were extinct in the wild except for, and kept in a few, uh, a few zoo reserves. Uh, they were introduced into the Chernobyl, Chernobyl zone because they thought this would be a nice place for them to live. 
know, let's put an let's get an endangered species and put it in the most radioactive place on the planet. Yeah, okay. Uh, but you know, there's been these again. There's these reports. There was a, an article published in Slate magazine uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, one of my a former employee of mine, in fact, who's taken a few photos. He's been working there since 1986, and he's managed to capture a half a dozen decent photos of wildlife in the area. And he, you know, and so he's published a few of these pictures. And here's some wild boar. Here's some eagle. Here's a an elk or something, uh, and, and there are some critters in the zone. It's absolutely true. Uh, but um, I want you to see this map. Now, you have to be able to see this map, right? So this is a, an outline of the Chernobyl zone. And I want you to see, here's the power plant, and the darker colors are the hotter areas. And what I want you to note is that there are vast areas of the Chernobyl zone that are absolutely pristine with respect to radioactive contamination and now there's no people there too. So it's a very heterogeneous place. And so as it turns out that if you go to these clean areas, and in fact this clean area right here is half the background radiation to Central Park. Central Park out here in New York is about 0.1 microsieverts per hour. This is about 0.05 in the cleanest parts of the Chernobyl zone. So to, to suggest, you know, Anyway, just, yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I think you get the idea. It's just, uh, y yes, you will see the occasional animal inside the zone just because it is a nice, clean place. It's a happy place. Anyway, so, but we decided to test this more directly because it actually doesn't matter if there are more animals inside the zone or not compared to outside. What, that, that avoids the, the main question. The main question is, is there an impact of the radioactive contaminants on these individuals and populations and species? That's the main question, not whether or not a fence keeps hunting out and allows some species to do better. So anyway, so we started counting them, and here's our first result. And this is the abundance of birds. And I apologize for graphs. I can't help it. Uh, we have to use them. <laughs> the abundance, the total numbers of birds, when you factor out all of these other things that can be, uh, that are associated with variation in bird numbers, and just look at the effects of radiation of the contaminants, about, there's only about as, a third as many birds as there should be in these radioactive areas, highly radioactive areas. And there's only half as many species because, again, some of the numbers are so low that they're not sustaining populations of a given species. So biodiversity, biodiversity is depressed by about half in these birds. When we first published this paper, some of, some of the folks said, well, you know, birds, they're just, they're hypersensitive to everything. You know, the canaries in the coal mine, right? You know, they're, they're, you know, you can't be thinking about just birds. And, and so we said, okay, we'll do something else. Uh, and, and actually, so we started counting the insects because actually we had noticed that it was really hard to find some of the insects. Uh, and, uh, and so anecdotally, so we decided to count them. And sure enough, uh, one, of the, one of the most notable things are, is an absence of bumblebees in these most contaminated areas. And you've all, some of you have heard about the reports out of Japan, uh, you know, mutant butterflies. It's true. Uh, you know, butterflies also appear to be hypersensitive to these contaminants, or hypersensitive. As a group, they seem to be much more sensitive than some of the other insect species. Uh, and, and, and very, very few butterflies in these most contaminated areas. Very few spiders, uh, and which is actually kind of pleasant because as you're doing work in the field, you don't have to worry about cobwebs hitting your face if you're an outdoorsy person. So one of the things I hate about doing field work is cobwebs. Don't have to worry about cobwebs in Chernobyl. Very many fewer grasshoppers, many fewer dragonflies. Uh, but of course, then, then the response you get is, well, insects. Who cares about insects? They're just bugs. Uh, what we care about are mammals, right? Because we're a mammal. And, and, and it took us a long time to figure out a way that we could sample the mammals, work with the mammals, uh, because they're not easy to work with. They're smart, they tend to be nocturnal, many of them are subterranean, at least part of the time. Uh, you know, they're just hard to, to do basic science with. And um, so then it dawned on us, let's go back in the winter and look at snow prints in the snow. Anybody know what this print is? It's a wolf, yeah. 
Yeah, so there are a few wolves in the Chernobyl zone, but mostly they're dogs. <laughs> and uh, but we so we counted all the all the mammals and found the same basic relationship: many fewer mammals in the more contaminated areas. Two years ago, we invited a group from Finland to come do some trapping, focusing on the small mammals. There have been a couple of folks in the U.S., for instance, who've been suggesting Muso and Mueller are wrong. We've been studying mammals, small mammals, for 15 years, and we see no effects. And, you know, there's no mutations, there's no effect on samples, on, on abundances. So we brought some independent folks who aren't connected with Department of Energy or any of these other organizations to trap the heck out of the mice, and we found the same basic pattern. Many fewer of these small rodents, big impacts on reproduction. So in fact, now when visitors come to the Chernobyl zone, you know, you've heard about all the tourism. The Ukrainian government has been trying to make money uh, by, uh, by, by busing in tourists to see the, the reactor. And of course, many of these tourists come because they've heard that there's a lot of wildlife that they can get pictures of. And, and of course, they come in and there's nothing to be seen. It's, you know, it's very, very rare to see anything uh, uh, of significance. And so they set up a petting zoo in the town of Chernobyl. Uh, this is a BBC reporter trying to get her pictures of the wild animals of Chernobyl. Uh, anyway, so, so I think we've managed to convince a few people at least that actually Chernobyl is not this wildlife haven as, as suggested by the Chernobyl Forum. We've repeated this work in Fukushima, first in July 2011, then in July 2012, and uh, as long as they allow us back into the country, we'll be back there in July 2013. Uh, again, at 400 discrete locations to do our biotic inventories. We've also been working with barn swallows and barn swallow nests. What do we find? Well, with respect to the birds, we're finding the same basic overall pattern with respect to uh, significantly reduced numbers of individuals in the more contaminated areas. It took us a couple of seasons to convince some of our local Japanese colleagues uh, uh, to, 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 to really listen carefully. But it's, 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 it's a very silent place in most of these highly contaminated areas. Many fewer birds, many fewer insects. And it, and it, it just smacks you in the face uh, if you're paying attention. Um, but anyway, strong effects. They're actually stronger in Fukushima. There were 14 species of birds where we could do direct comparisons between Chernobyl and Fukushima. And the relationship between radiation and abundance was twice as strong in Fukushima this first year uh, as it is in Chernobyl, implying that perhaps there's uh, a lack of uh, resistance or there's an increased rate of sensitivity in this naive population. Perhaps Chernobyl birds have evolved resistance to some degree or, or just the ones that are susceptible have been weeded out already over the last 26 years. We don't really know uh, the answer to that, but we're, we're hoping to get to it. I've only got a few more minutes here, but uh, if you, and again, you probably can't see this very well, but maybe you can. Chernobyl. Basically, every group that we've looked at show declines in the higher, more highly contaminated areas. In Fukushima, the first year, we just basically saw, you know, bird abundance and biodiversity. Uh, butterflies were dramatically impacted, negatively impacted, as were cicadas, which aren't found in Chernobyl, so there's no comparison. But the other groups of insects were, were not negatively affected as best we could tell and spiders actually went up in numbers in the more contaminated areas. Anybody have any ideas why spiders might go up? Why would spiders go up? Excellent. Bioecology 101, that's great. There's no birds around. So, you know, the main, the main cause of spider mortality are, are birds. And so that's our suggestion. The second year, uh, we, we've just finished the second year uh, analysis, and it turns out that the effects are getting stronger. The, and this is just a plot showing year-to-year um, -year change in the slope of the relationship between radiation and abundance, and the slopes are generally more negative in the second year than the first year. We'll see what happens this coming year. Um, I just want to show a couple more slides. 
because um, I, I, I don't want to eat into my, my, my colleagues' time too much here. But um, the, uh, so, so we know that population effects are significant. Are there developmental abnormalities? And, and I need to show just a couple slides because there's some pretty pictures, or not so pretty pictures. But we don't see any Godzillas or, or, or King Kongs, of course. But what we do see are very strangely anomalous uh, organisms, including you know, birds with very strange color patterns. So here's a barn swallow here. He's a partial albino. Here's a better view of the sorts of strange uh, color patterns. Again, not enough to kill any bird, but this bird, this is a male bird, and you can bet that this will influence his reproductive success. Girls don't like this. Girl birds don't like this color pattern. Um, interestingly enough, I just got this photo by email from the from the Japan. Wild Bird Association just the other day. Uh, and this is from uh, Minamisoma, which is a little town just north of the reactor on the coast. And I don't know if you can see this. See these little patches of white feathers here? This is, what we, this is where we started first seeing anomalies in Chernobyl. And uh, I, so I was shocked and surprised. Well, maybe I shouldn't have been, but I was uh, surprised that they would capture these photos and send them to me. Uh, so, so we're starting to see some, some consequences potentially. We need to go back and verify that this is real. But we see all sorts of strange abnormalities, tumors on the beaks, uh, strange growths on the beaks, strange missing patches of skin. And let me just skip ahead a little bit. Tumors around the eye are really quite common. Um, here's a tumor over on the side of the head. Uh, patches of white feathers where there shouldn't be white feathers. Some strange growths on their feet. Tumors on their wings. There's a close-up. Uh, strange growths around their, their rear ends. Just never been seen anywhere else in any great abundance, and they're much more common in areas of high contamination. Their brains are smaller. The uh, neurological development's clearly impacted as a consequence of the, the contamination in direct proportion. And not only that, if they have smaller brains, they, have, they clearly have reduced cognitive function because they're much less likely to survive to the next year with these smaller brains. Uh, the trees are deformed. Uh, here's a you know, Christmas tree looking you know, Pinus sylvestris, which is normally tall and straight, like a loblolly or a longleaf pine with a single trunk. Here are some other images of the deformed um, trees that you see all over the place. Some of this is the result of mutations. Some of this is the result of ongoing radiotoxicity from the, from the cesium in the environment. Here's a fire bug. Uh, somebody mentioned Claudia, uh, Cornelia uh, has a... Yeah, Honegger, uh, the Swiss artist who first started to document these abnormal insects around nuclear power plants in Europe. Uh, here's the fire bug, which is one of the bugs she do first documented. And, uh, and here is a collection of our Chernobyl fire bugs. And if you think of these as being sort of African face mask-like things, it's really easy to see the abnormalities. Very, very unusual patterns. Again, highly correlated to background radiation levels. Uh, we got a paper coming out uh, in the next few weeks, maybe a month, showing that the birds in Chernobyl have much higher rates of cataracts. Again, another trait associated with ionizing radiation. And as I mentioned before, uh, fertility rates are dramatically impacted with many of the birds having no sperm. So I think um, I could go on and on and on and on and on and I want. <laughs> and let me just uh, finish uh, again at, with the beginning again. Um, so why has it been so easy? Apparently easy. It's not been easy in the sense I've had to eat a lot of Russian food. Uh, but uh, why has it been so easy for us to go in and document one response after the next that just they just they slap you in the face. They're so easy to find. It really hasn't taken uh, you know a genius to make these observations. Uh, they're they're there, and the answer is of course that nobody has looked. 
or, or if they've looked, they haven't follow, followed through to compile the data and to analyze it properly and then to finally you know, publish it. Why is that? Why haven't they done this? Vladimir, why haven't they done this? Yes, sir. That's exact. I, uh, that's that's what I'm thinking. They don't want to know the answer to these questions, and 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 so how are they avoiding finding the answers? They they just don't pay for research in this area. So they don't fund it. Yeah. So with that, I think I will step down and pass the podium on. Thank you very much. I want to pay homage to Tim Rousseau, who with his colleagues is actually endangering his life by going into extremely high radioactive areas, doing pioneering work, which is going to change the concept of radiation exposure to humans. And as you know, we physicians always test drugs and other things upon animals before we extrapolate and use them on human beings. What is happening to the animals, the insects and the plants is going to happen to us. Only we take a long time to reproduce. Certainly in Sweden, they've shown that babies in utero at the time of Chernobyl have lower than normal IQs because the developing brain is very sensitive to radiation. That's reproduced in Tim's work. Extremely important work.